أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن قارون كان من قوم موسى فبغى عليهم وآتيناه من الكنوز ما إن مفاتحه لتنوء بالعصبة أولي القوة إذ قال له قومه لا تفرح إن الله لا يحب الفرحين وابتغ فيما آتاك الله الدار الآخرة ولا تنس نصيبك من الدنيا وأحسن كما أحسن الله إليك ولا تبغ الفساد في الأرض إن الله لا يحب المفسدين قال إنما أوتيته على علم عندي أولم يعلم أن الله قد أهلك من قبله من القرون من هو أشد منه قوة من هو أشد منه قوة وأكثر جمعا ولا يسأل عن ذنوبهم المجرمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask the Almighty to bless him and his entire household, those who supported him from day one. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all his companions, as well as every single one of us and our offspring to come up to the day of Qiyamah, not forgetting those who have struggled and strove through the years in order to preserve this deen, in a way that today it has come to us. May Allah use us to do the same for the future generations. <coughs> Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, this evening we will be talking about the purification of the soul. The believer, as you know, is only successful if he develops his link with his maker and cleanses his heart. We refer to the heart, we refer to the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about cleansing oneself from the sins that are apparent as well as those that are hidden. So in the Quran he says, Leave and abandon all sins, whether they are outward or hidden, inward, inside. And I'm sure we all know that the outward sins are quite clear for everyone to see. Those which are inside are sometimes completely invisible to the rest, it is only through interaction that some of them can be picked up. And sometimes even with interaction, some of these sins cannot be picked up. So it is up to us to purify not only the soul but the heart. Knowing that some of the scholars refer to the heart and the soul using the same term and some have separated the two. What we do need to understand is that the heart is described in the hadith of halal and haram which appears in Sahih Muslim narrated by an numan ibn Bashir radiyallahu anhu. Inna al-halal bayyin wa inna al-haram bayyin. Wa baynahuma umurun mushtabihatun la ya'lamuhunna kathirun minan nas. Halal is quite clear and haram is also quite clear. And between the two, there may be a gray area where people may not know is this halal or is this haram. So the hadith continues to say, فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام. Whoever stays away from that which is doubtful has protected himself and his religion, and whoever falls into that which is doubtful has fallen into haram. If I can stop there for a moment and quickly explain, if a person 
were to be told that this particular piece of food that you're about to eat is poisonous. And as soon as you put it in your mouth, you will die. And 20 people are saying that to him. And another 20 say, no, don't worry. It's fine. It's okay. We've checked it out and so on. And you can eat it. That is a very clear example of what we are saying today. Meaning in this hadith. If you were to put it in your mouth, it's as though you've committed suicide. You're gone. You've killed yourself. Because 20 are saying this and 20 are saying that. And if you were to leave it, you would save yourself completely. So there is no risk involved by leaving it. And yet by taking it, you are definitely risking your life. This is as far as a foodstuff goes, which may be poisonous. But when it comes to the deen and what Allah has revealed and sent down, there are things that are clear, things that are not clear for some. And the clarity is either this way or that way. You know this is permissible and this is not permissible. That is clear. But sometimes there is a debated issue in the center. If you are to protect yourself from it, perhaps you will be able to safeguard your deen. And in this particular narration, some may say that this is speaking more about foodstuffs and so on. But the wording of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes far beyond anything that can be termed halal or haram is included in this particular narration. Then the hadith continues to say, كَالْرَاعِي يَرْعَى حَوْلَ الْحِمَى يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَرْتَعَى فِيهِ أَوْ يَقْعَى فِيهِ Similar to a shepherd who has allowed his flock to graze upon the border of his land, not knowing whether it has gone onto the land of the neighbor because the demarcation is not so clear. So there is a point up to which he knows this is my land. Beyond that, he is not so clear. Is this my land or is it not my land? So when he goes to that gray area, he doesn't know whether it's his or not. What a big risk. He is now grazing his shepherd or his sheep as a shepherd on land that may not be his. And this is why the narration continues to say, Ala wa inna li kulli malikin hima. Ala wa inna hima Allahi maharimuhu. Behold, every king has limits. Every king has a border. Limits beyond which you are not allowed or you will not be allowed to cross. Every king has rules, regulations. And indeed, the limits of Allah are those things He has made prohibited. Don't go there. Subhanallah. Then it continues making mention of the heart. And this is what we are trying to get to. Behold, in the body there is a piece of flesh. If it is pure and clean and good, the entire body will be pure and clean and good. And if it is dirty, impure and not good, then the whole body will be dirty, impure and not good. Behold, that organ or that piece of flesh is the heart. Subhanallah. So if your heart is clean, everything else will be okay. If your heart is dirty, everything else will be dirty. And when we say clean heart, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are just a person who's non-judgmental. You see, sometimes they say, don't judge me. You're giving them advice. You say, brother, you're not supposed to go to the nightclub. Hey, stop judging me. What are you talking about? We're just advising you. So don't use the term, do not judge me, in order to run away from advice. Sometimes it becomes different for the, difficult for the scholars or for those who want to advise others to advise them. Sister, your, your hair is supposed to be covered. Sister, you're supposed to be dressing in a proper way. My brother, you're not supposed to be bouncing around on the street with your backside half showing. Allahu Akbar. Stop judging me. But your backside's judging you. Allahu Akbar. And this happens. And we get these answers on a daily basis. Well, to be honest, nobody is judging. But it does not mean that if a person has uttered these type of words that their heart is dirty. No, brother, sister, they are advising you for your better. Wallahi, moments ago I was listening to a clip in the Urdu language of one of the cricketers in Pakistan. I don't even know exactly who he is, but I believe he is one of the top cricketers of the globe. And he was making mention of who his real friends are. Do you know what he said? He's a cricketer. He says, the real friends are the ulama. My real friends are those scholars who keep reminding me what is my duty to Allah, what is halal and haram, 
and the fact that I'm going to go into my grave with no body, no cricket bat and no ball and no score and nothing from the Guinness Book of Records but just me and my own records, the deeds I've done. Imagine a cricketer, a man who's one of the top on the globe, confirming that those scholars who continue reminding me, telling me that I am a person who's, I am a person who's going to go into my grave all alone. Those are my true friends, subhanallah. What about us? What do we have next to our names? Do we hate the people who remind us? If that's the case, purification of the heart and soul is required. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us purify. Wallahi, it is a difficult age that we are moving in because people do not realize that when others are reminding you to purify your soul, your heart, they are not judging you. They are, they are helping you. They are giving you a word of encouragement. Don't just give that answer. That is an answer that sometimes the globe gives in order to get away with murder, to keep on committing sin. We will not judge you. We love you, my sister, but we don't love your bad habit. We love you, my brother. We don't love your bad habit. I was about to say we don't love your backside. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Wallahi, it's true. Thinking of people, Wallahi, my brother, we love you. We really want you. That's why we're telling you don't do that. We had an image doing its rounds on the internet where some of the scholars had to say, please don't, you know, uh, send this around because they were showing Jumu'ah, I think it was two weeks ago, in a masjid. I, okay, let's not say where it was in case you might recognize the brother. But they were showing him making his sunnah as the khutbah is going on and the people behind him were so harmed and hurt they had to get up. And some of them, you know, sharp enough to pick up their phones and say, let's, you know, tell the people what's happening around here. May Allah safeguard us. We should not be exposing people, but the people should not be exposing themselves. Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters, let's purify our souls for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does this happen? We need to do something about it. Don't think that I just make a dua, Ya Allah, clean me, purify my soul and it will. Dua is a part of it, definitely. Allahumma, ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, O oh Allah, in whose hands, or O oh Allah, who is the owner of the movement of the hearts, move my heart towards the deen, on the deen, keep it steadfast. But that statement will be of no use if you do not have an intention to purify yourself. Work hard on matters like hatred. Remove that hatred for your fellow brothers in the deen and have hatred for sin rather than the individual whom you are supposed to be looking at and saying, this is my brother in Islam. If you are supposed to be hating people because of a sin they may be committing, remember, everybody will hate everybody because none of us can put up our hands and say we are sinless. Can anyone now here put up their hands and say, I am spotless, sinless, I have not sinned? Not one, subhanallah. Not one. Not even myself, because we are human beings. So the reality, we will hate the sin, we will hate the shirk, we will hate the bid'ah, but we will work on the brother or the sister in a way that we will try to help them come out of that shirk, come out of that bid'ah, come out of that sin, for example. But at the same time, remembering that this is a person who has declared the shahada and I have as well. They may have sinned differently to me, but in the same way I want to be helped, I need them to be helped and I will try my best to do that or at least make dua for them. This is why we say, you see a brother with a bottle in his hand, a bad Muslim would go around tweeting that and go around Facebooking it and WhatsApping it and so oning it. Subhanallah. Why? Because they want the world to know, I saw that man with a bottle. But a good Muslim will do one of two things or both. They will either go to the brother, say, brother, you know what, this is something bad. And you know, you're a Muslim, come on, you know. Inshallah, there's much goodness expected from you by the will of Allah. You're such a great person. You have so much potential. This thing is not going to do you any good. Engage them. Not swearing, engage them properly to say, look, this is something that is unacceptable in the deen. You know, it will cause a lot of damage, a lot of harm. If you quit this, I think there are a lot of good habits that you have. Just quit this and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may open the brother's doors through your effort and you will be granted goodness. For Allah to use you to guide a single person is better for you than anything of, of the highest material value in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all.
That is point number one, you either go to him or someone who has an effect or impact on him and perhaps tell them to talk to him if you cannot talk to him. And secondly, make dua for that brother. Ya Allah, today I witnessed someone with a bottle. It hurt me, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, guide them, help them to remove the bottle. Help them to give up that bad habit and help me to give up whatever bad habit I have. Allahu Akbar. This is purity of the heart now. With that dua and that nasiha, if Allah wills, that person's heart will come onto the right path within a matter of time. We know so many people who had very bad pasts, but now when they've come up straight, subhanallah, they've gone very far in life in terms of the deen and become closer to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many of us, perhaps we are much better today than we were yesterday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant, that good, grant us goodness. This is why we say, brother, when you have become religious, remember, when you are inviting others towards religion, you also came about slowly, so give them a little bit of time. The problem with us, we come on the deen after 50 years, and everyone else, we give them five minutes. <laughs> Wallahi, it's a problem in the ummah. We are facing it. We are not patient. We are supposed to be patient as Muslimin. It took you 40 years to recognize your maker. Why do you want to, in four minutes, create such a situation that remove a man from the whole fold of the deen, kick him out, curse him to the degree that you've buried him alive and you haven't given him more than four minutes to repent. You took 40 years, my brother. Thank Allah he showed you the light. <coughs> Allahu Akbar, work on them. Continue working on them. The Prophet Sallallahu Nubuwa was not 23 minutes, nor was it 23 days, nor was it 23 months. It was 23 solid years. Allahu Akbar. So purify your heart when it comes to your relation with others. Because there is something known as Hukukul Ibad, through which a lot of what your heart conceals becomes manifest. We hate for the sake of Allah the deeds that are done in the displeasure of Allah. We may hate for the sake of Allah those who have absolutely no goodness in them and they have damaged the deen or they have caused lots of damage to those who follow the deen. But remember, even the non-Muslims, every single non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. If you lose focus on that, you have lost the path. Every single non-Muslim is a potential Muslim by the will of Allah. For as long as they are breathing, there is hope. Who is ready to invite them in the proper way? Allahu Akbar. A very big statement that brings tears to the eyes. Every non-Muslim... When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a dua for the enemies of Islam, one of the prayers were, "Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al-umarain." O oh Allah, grant strength to this deen through the acceptance of Islam of one of the two Umars. One was known as Umar ibn al-Khattab, رضي الله عنه, later to be known as, and the other one, Amr ibn Hisham, who was known as Abu Jahl. No sooner was the dua made, response came from Allah subhanahu wa taala. This man came marching into this house of Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu anhu, as the books of history have made mention. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that Allah is the one who guides. Just like he guided me, he may guide you or anyone on the street. So remember, when we say cleanse your heart and do not be judgmental, we need to understand what the statement means. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who realize that we would like to help one another to become steadfast on the deen. And that help can happen in so many different ways, depending on the authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you as well. If we have hatred in our hearts, now let's talk of general hatred, not necessarily whilst giving da'wah, but at the same time, hatred in our hearts for someone, for some reason, normally it stems from jealousy. Not every time, but a lot of the times. Because Allah has blessed someone with more wealth, with more knowledge, with more acceptance, perhaps with, with greater looks. You know, you have a woman who's extremely beautiful and sometimes, or a girl who's extremely good looking. And sometimes you have other girls who make her life so difficult and her crime is just that she is gorgeous. I would have told you to say, mashallah, but it's abstract. There's no one in particular we're talking about. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> So alhamdulillah, or you can say inshallah. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, wallahi, do not become jealous of the favors that Allah has bestowed others. 
just because you don't have it. Don't. It will result in the dirty heart. The heart will become unclean, filthy, and it will require cleansing. Cleansing of the heart is also done through what is known as dhikrullah. Because everything has a detergent, and the detergent of the heart is the remembrance of Allah. But I'd like to interpret the term dhikrullah in its broader context. Dhikrullah starts with understanding the meaning of the Qur'an. That's where it starts. That's the beginning of it. Because the, the, the dhikr that is mentioned in the Qur'an, so many times it directly refers to the Qur'an. And at times it refers to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So remember, you need to know the message of Allah in order to have your heart purified. What did Allah say to me? I always, always say it is a big insult. Some of us, how old we are, how regular we are with our salah, yet we have not made an effort to understand the meanings of what we utter in salah. Wallahi, it is an insult. We don't even know what is meant by Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahman ar rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. Some people do not know the meaning. And some people do not think of the meaning when they are uttering these words. So what value do you have? How is your heart going to be impacted? Look at the hearts of those who were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. When they heard a single verse, their lives changed. When they heard one verse, their hearts were purified. Umar ibn al-Khattab himself, who was an enemy of Islam, the opening verses of Surah Taha were read to him. Not more than a few lines were read to him. He began to tremble. Immediately, his heart was cleansed because he had that sincerity in his heart. For a moment, it was struck with sincerity. And he said, take me to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Guided from kufr to iman in a split moment because of the Qur'an. And this has happened to so many people. It has happened to people around us in our midst, perhaps some who might be seated here, reverted immediately. Allahu Akbar. Why? They read the Qur'an and they realized this is the word of Allah. I always tell people, you know, I have a disc, an MP3 disc in my vehicle, given to me by someone in Malaysia, a brother. Allah grant him goodness. <coughs> and in it, or on it, there is the entire Qur'an just in the English language. So the Arabic has been, you know, separated. Now we know the importance of the Arabic and the English. And he says, this is extremely beneficial to those who speak the language. And I thought to myself, look, to me, the Arabic is powerful. The English is fair enough trying to explain what the Arabic is. But the word of Allah is that particular Arabic. You cannot compromise it. So I thought to myself, let me put it in and try and listen to what is being said. And I had a non-Muslim sit in my car once, one who had come to do some work and I was taking him back to his place. I saw tears in his eyes. Four or five surahs were read within a short space of time in the English language alone. And he told me, what is this? I said, what do you think it is? He said, it's something powerful. He said, it has to be the book you guys follow. I said, it is. Can I come to your place of worship? By all means, brother. Subhanallah. I think within a short space of time, may Allah grant him guidance to the deen. I mean, that's when I realized, I said, you know what? Sometimes when people are just going through even the meaning of it, because they understand it, it impacts differently. Without reducing the importance of the tilawa in the Arabic language. Because indeed that is on a level of its own. But at the same time, remember the impact of that. If you understand what you're reading is totally different. You need that as well. So your purification will start when you have made an intention to understand the word of Allah. I said moments ago, they heard four verses of the Quran, they embraced Islam. They read four verses of the Quran, they embraced the deen of Islam. We have read what we know as khatma upon khatma upon khatma, once a month, sometimes once a week, sometimes once every two months. We've completed the entire mushaf. But brother, you cannot give up your pornography. A'udhu billah. It did not move you. Pornography is the problem of the age, wallahi. It's a difficulty. It affects your eyes, your brain, your mind, your organs, your reproductive system, your, the way you look at the opposite sex, your marriage, absolutely everything is made rotten through a cancer because of your eyes perceiving 
some dirty sexual movements of the opposite sex. Totally haram, completely unacceptable, but available on your phone. Today, I was speaking to some brothers on our journey back from Birmingham, and I made mention of a very interesting point. Your mobile phone that you have, my brothers, my sisters, can take you to Jannah or Jahannam. Remember that. The way you use it, you have any scholar on the globe that has Allah has used to affect you and impact on you at your fingertips. At the time of your convenience, in your bedroom, subhanallah. Perhaps whilst you're lying down, you can click every night either on a scholar where you can listen to something regarding your deen and go to bed feeling a good Muslim. Or you can click onto a pornographic site and perhaps you will be caught in that web which will take you very, very far away. It's to do with how clean or dirty your heart is. If you want to purify yourself, you need to force yourself before you go to bed. Click that phone, listen to a 10 minute clip of a scholar of your choice. Subhanallah. And then go to bed. Every day that 10 minute dose will wake you up. But if you have a one minute dose of that which is pornographic or ugly or dirty or unacceptable, Wallahi, it is like a seed that grows. And when the tree grows big, it's going to be very hard to uproot it. My brothers, my sisters, get rid of it now. Now, make an intention here and now. Ya Allah, if you take me before I exit this masjid, let me be a pure person. I seek forgiveness for all my sins. I change my life. Allahu Akbar. How many more scholars would you like to hear before you change your life? Before you decide to purify that heart of yours without an effort from you? The heart is not going to be purified. When you have your own kitchen and you've cooked your food and your pans are dirty, you cannot just look at the pans and expect them to become clean. Even if you've got a dishwasher, you've got to pick the thing up, put it into the dishwasher, choose the detergent, turn on the water, press the button, then things happen. Subhanallah. We still don't have that eye control, the eye control of the pan. And if you thought you did, they'd take you to the hospital. Believe me. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So these are powerful words of reminder for myself to begin with. My brother, my sister, how do you use your Twitter account? What type of a profile do you have? How do you use your Facebook account? It can take you to paradise or it can drive you to hell very easily. Believe me, it's up to you when you press click and when you press like. And it's up to you to go home and dislike or to dislike it here and now whilst we're talking. Because I know there are brothers, perhaps maybe even sisters, busy on their phones whilst we're talking. To be honest, I actually don't see a single one, mashallah. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So I need to swallow back my word. But this is what it is. If your heart is dirty, it begins to show your own self. You can see it. Your mind can figure it out. Why? Because you lead a life. What will happen to it? It will be full of bunk. You know, it will be so narrow, full of depression, full of stress, full of lack of contentment. Where is my contentment gone? It's gone with the pornographic sight. It's gone with the adultery that you cannot give up. Adultery is a seed. Wallahi, if you sow it and you water it, watering means you return to it and you water it more, you return to it more, it grows a tree. When the tree becomes big and strong, it becomes more difficult to uproot it. You get hooked onto it. To the degree that it, it's just like second nature. No regret thereafter. Until you die in a condition. May Allah safeguard us. We had some brothers who came to me some time back. Telling me, you know, what do we do? Our father was looking like such a religious man. And he died in the midst of two prostitutes with beer bottles. Do you want that to be the end of your life? May Allah protect us all. Na'udhu billah. May Allah safeguard us. Well, if that's the case, do not let that be a probability. Rather, let salah be a probability, possibility. If you engage in five salah, the chances of you dying in salah are very great. Do you know that? There are so many who have died in sujood and ruku'ah. But if you don't read salah, there is no chance of that happening to you. Not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us away whilst we are in His obedience. And may He protect us, really. That we are not disgraced dying in his disobedience. My brothers and sisters, life is too short. We cleanse our heart from malice, from dirt, from jealousy. Jealousy leads to that hatred, subhanallah. When you hate someone, you start planning their downfall. 
And what happens when you plan someone's downfall? You lose focus from your own life. Because now everything I do, it's to do him down. I'm going to fight this man, I'm going to do this to him, I'm going to do this to this sister or this woman, I'm going to make sure this happens and that happens, whether it is the young age starting from the school rivalry that we have because of what someone looks like or how sharp they are, what type of friends they may have and how sociable they may be or not be. These are all little problems we face in schools, primary as well as high school and so on. You know, some people only flock around those who are wealthy, others flock around those who are popular, others flock around those who are intelligent. And we leave sometimes the best of people who have the best of character and conduct just because they are quiet sitting in one corner. Allahu Akbar. Perhaps from them you might have benefited more. So don't make people's lives difficult. When you start making someone's life hard, you have lost focus from your own. You know, we are very fortunate that in Britain, I'm going to say something that really might be affecting some. We are very fortunate that in Britain the houses are small and there's a shortage of space. Do you know why? You have less problems of in-laws than we do back in Africa. <laughs> because you have to live separately, like it or not, in most cases. Why I say this is because when there are many people living together, you, that cannot be possible unless you have a very big heart. You need to be a selfless person who loves Allah and the deen and who allows people their freedom, subhanallah, who respects and who serves. Otherwise, it cannot work. It doesn't happen. You're living with so many people, subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. So this is why I say you're lucky. You've got small homes. But I think the hearts are big, inshallah. Let's hope that. Allahu Akbar. At least we can... A heart is something... You know, when you exercise your muscles, they inflate, don't they? Mashallah. Youngsters would like to look big, you know. They'd like to look muscular. When you exercise your heart correctly, it also becomes big, mashallah. Big in the right way. Alhamdulillah. So we ask Allah to grant us good hearts, big hearts, to be generous. Generosity is a good quality of the heart, which stems from the goodness of the soul. But when we are stingy and miserly, everything goes wrong, because then we begin to hate people. You don't spend on your own family. Come on, my brother. You don't spend on your children. So where's your wealth going? Allahu Akbar. Are you amassing it? The verses I read before you, Qarun, that's what he did. He amassed the wealth. And you know what was his problem? He had such a dirty heart, such a filthy soul, that he related whatever he had to himself and not to his maker. That brings me to a point. Whatever goodness you have is from Allah. The evil and bad from yourself and shaitan. Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. So you recognize your own nafs and you recognize shaitan who is trying to work on you and divorce yourself from the devil. You find yourself getting closer to Allah. It's like a seesaw. Your soul, within it, there is this seesaw type of a relation. You either move closer to the devil and further from Allah or closer to Allah and further from the devil. Simple. Simple. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us purity. My brothers and sisters, another bad habit is when we are selfish, we want everything for ourselves, rather develop our hearts and souls to be selfless to the degree that we can share. Something known as al-ithar. Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising the ansar. What did they do? They welcomed strangers who were brothers in deen into their homes by the instruction of Allah. When Allah instructed, they welcomed their brothers who were strangers. Had it not been for the link of Iman, there would be no other link. Welcomed them into the home and shared their wealth 50-50. Today we cannot share our wealth with the suffering souls in Syria or Somalia, or anywhere else on the globe, and nobody's asking you to open your doors, to let them live in your house, and share everything 50-50, but we're not ready to give out 5%, without them coming even into our houses. That's why we're not Sahaba. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grant us purity of the heart, so that at least we can be Sahaba in the Akhirah. We'd like to be in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They really had such good hearts, so much purification within the heart, 
they gave so much to their suffering brothers and sisters to the degree that life was made comfortable for these people who had come known as muhajireen and allah praises them by saying yu'thiruna ala anfusihim walau kana bihim khasasa they gave their brethren preference over themselves even though they needed it a lot more they were in dire need of what they were actually giving away we are asking you for very little or your suffering brothers and sisters across the globe perhaps in your neighborhood perhaps in your masjid are not asking you to give up that which you are in need of but that which you do not need how many of us have wardrobes full of clothes that we've never worn for the last year my sister give it away do not let your heart cling to this worldly material items that are there allahu akbar you may use them you may enjoy them within the limits of allah nobody is saying no you may make use of it you may become happy whilst using it but remember don't let it be a waste extravagance is a sign of the dirty heart and the dirty soul allah says in the quran such people who are extravagant and wasteful they are the brethren of the devil Allahu Akbar. Those who are wasteful, extravagant, and so on, they are the brethren of shaitan, and shaitan is ungrateful, which means wastefulness is a sign of ingratitude. Wastefulness is a sign of ingratitude. You have so many pairs of shoes, 45 pairs of shoes, one for every occasion. The wedding coming up next week, you've already sewn a brand new pair of clothing and you've got 60 pairs in your closet. Don't worry, my sister, they are not going to know that you wore this for, for the wedding that was 10 weddings back. That's how we've got to speak. And if you want to sew and you have the ability to sew something new for every function, make a promise to Allah, for every one I get, I'm going to give one away. Make sure it is a cut within the pleasure of Allah. Because if you give away a skirt with a slit that is going to expose a female whom you have given it to, you may be amassing a sin rather than getting something in terms of reward. You think you are giving a charity. One day we were given donations from somewhere in Zimbabwe. And they, were, they told us, please give this to the poor. Wallahi, when we took some of it out, not all of it, some of it out, we were so embarrassed as to what it was, and we decided this, we cannot give it to anyone, no one, because we cannot allow the people to wear it. They're going to think, wow, this guy must be a real, real romantic dude giving it to me. Wallahi, akh, it's not from me. <laughs> My sister, what an embarrassment. We're giving it to someone, and they might take it home, give it to their sister, and they know where it came from, and they have such a bad feeling in their heart about you, that this guy is actually someone besides what he is purporting to be. Yet, it's not from me, it's from a donor. And when they donated, they're asking Allah, Ya Allah, taqabbal minna, oh Allah, accept from us our sadaqah. What sadaqah? <laughs> what sadaqah are you giving? It's like giving a bottle of alcohol and saying, Ya Allah, accept it from me as a sadaqah. Not at all. It is haram. Why did you have that in the first place? You should be embarrassed of it. And this is why we say, my sisters, Buy clothes or sew clothes that inshallah one day you can give out as a sadaqah by the will of Allah. Just the mere giving it out later on, even if you've used it and it's in good condition. There are people across the globe who might not even have that much. But if you've given that, it may be a means of your entry into paradise. So just sew it properly, inshallah. Make sure it is within the obedience of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know what the sisters are thinking, but I use it at home in my bedroom. See? Sharp. They say very, very quick thinkers today. Wallahi, my sister, what you do in your bedroom is none of our business. It's between you and your husband, inshallah. The difficulty is we're talking of people who are not yet married sometimes. Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. And may Allah open our doors. And even if we are married, we need to understand and realize when you're giving someone something, you need to know what you are giving them. Especially as a mu'mina. We are supposed to be tahirat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. I think this mic is cutting every little while to remind us that it's not only about the sisters.
It's about the brothers sitting in front of us as well. My beloved brothers, wallahi, we are so grateful to Allah. How do we show this gratitude that we are part of the ummah? We love each other for the pleasure of Allah. Wallahi, wallahi, we see beautiful faces, mashallah. We see people whom we love solely for the pleasure of Allah. You are trying to earn Jannah and so am I. And I ask Allah in this blessed gathering in one of his houses, Ya Allah, unite us in Jannah the same way you brought us together here today. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, we need to become generous. We need to know that there are people across the globe suffering. Sometimes we throw away our food, not realizing there are others who actually do not have that food. Purify your soul and you'll realize the value of even the ni'mah of Allah upon you. We were speaking of Qarun. Do you know what he said? He said, whatever I got is from my own intellect. Allah says, oh, he doesn't even realize our hand there. He doesn't realize where it came from. Allah says, we destroyed him and everything he had. And we let the earth swallow it up. And there was nothing left the following day. And there were people who used to wish they had like him. Oh, they were reminded by the scholars. You cannot wish for something of this nature, which came by wrongdoing. And at the same time, with arrogance. And when they saw what happened, they said, just as well, we did not get what he has or what he had. Because if we had got that, we would have perhaps been swallowed by the earth just like he was. This is why you want to ask Allah, ask him for Jannah to start with. Ask him for Thabat, ask him for purification, ask him for the ability to remain steadfast. Ask him to let the heart be inclined towards him rather than to let it drown in the illicit love of this world sometimes. When I say illicit, I mean you get married, you protect your heart from depression and stress by the will of Allah. So long as you've married the right brother or the right sister. But if you want to develop that love without having been married to someone, it will not result in anything but the dirtiness of your own heart. مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا وَيُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every single child is born upon nature. The nature of the belief in Allah alone, they will understand it and realize it. That heart which is pure, completely pure. But what happens? Over time, the heart becomes impure because of the environment. The parents sometimes divert people this way, that way. Your friends can also make your heart dirty to subhanallah. And when we speak of that type of purification, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the heart that is on the highest level. When he describes the day of judgment, he says, The day of judgment. <laughs> On that day, your wealth and your children will not help you. The only thing that will help you is the pure heart, the accepted, correct heart. That heart which stood firm on the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart that struggled to keep shaitan at bay. And the heart that engaged in constant repentance. If you repent correctly, it, on its own it will help you abstain from sin. How does that happen? Because if you say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. In the morning, for example, the Prophet ﷺ through the day said it up to a hundred times. And if we are to do that, say for example, whilst I'm walking, I've said it five, six times. As I'm entering, a, a, for example, a, a store, I say it another five, six times, bearing in mind what I'm saying. And then, for example, whilst I'm coming out, I say it a few times, bearing in mind what I'm saying. And throughout the day, I'm saying it, you know, scattered through the day here and there, a few times here and there. What will happen? The minute there is a sin to be committed, I will feel immediately, it doesn't go together with this tawbah that I've been engaging in through the day. The two don't come together. I'm on one hand saying, oh Allah, forgive me. And on the other hand, I'm busy gazing, the wrong gaze. It won't come together. It won't. So this is why they say, engage in istighfar, that will protect you. What else will protect you? Your salah will protect you. Salah when it is read correctly on time, when you are worried about the next one, that is when you are reading salah correctly. That's a sign that your salah is valid and correct. This is why the hadith describes, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ A man whose heart is connected to the masjid, meaning 
connected to salah, connected to the house of Allah, in the case of the sisters, connected to your salah, when you read one, you're worried about the next one. This is a gift of Allah. How many of us, we fulfill salah, and already we worried about the next one. Try and achieve that. You find your heart will be cleansed. Wallahi, the sins will eradicate themselves. Because, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Salah itself prohibits and prevents you from immorality and evil. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us. May He grant us goodness. So this is why we say, subhanallah, this qalbun salim, this pure heart should be the dream of every one of us. Save yourselves. Remember Allah a lot. Protect yourselves from jealousy, from envy. Protect yourselves from that which is bad. The love of sin. That which you commit in private, that is what destroys your heart. One sin in private is more dangerous. One sin in private is more dangerous than what you, you think. The reason is, when a person commits a sin on his own between him and Allah, although it may not be as bad as committing it openly with arrogance, but there is a difference. When you get used to doing something on your own that is bad, perhaps sometimes people might not correct you. When you commit it openly, sometimes a person might correct you. And this is why the hadith speaks of it from another angle, where the Prophet ﷺ says, there is hope for people for as long as they, they are not proud of their sin and they don't openly commit it. So that angle, yes, it's in the hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ. But that which you do in private, it, it does not mean it's belittled. It is very dangerous. It is venomous. It is poisonous. It is something that may grow into roots of evil that are like the arteries around your heart. They've blocked it, sealed it. If you've ever seen the diagram of a heart and you see all the, the veins and capillaries and arteries and various other blood vessels around the heart, they, they come so well around the heart that they form like a cage around it. Imagine if that was full of evil. What would happen to us? This is why develop your link with Allah silently. One of the means of purifying your heart. Sallu billayli wa nasu niyam. Engage in acts of worship when people are fast asleep. Read your salah at night. When nobody is watching besides Allah, why is this going to purify your heart? Because you are doing it for the sake of Allah. If committing a sin, when you think nobody is watching, is very very bad and evil, and dirties your heart, then engaging in a good deed when nobody is watching, will have the opposite effect. It will purify your heart and cleanse it. So this is why there are so many evidences to prove that a good deed that is done in private is far more beneficial than the same good deed which may be done sometimes openly. Beneficial from a certain angle. That is purification of the heart. Your link with Allah is a secret between you and Allah. Mostly who knows my connection with Allah? Only I know it. I know what water I'm swimming in. I know what hot soup I might be in. And so do you. Subhanallah. It's only Allah who knows this. So you need to know between you and Allah, what's your link? Develop it. Make Allah your best friend. Give that love to Allah. And the love of Allah is known by your obedience. It is not known by mere statements of the tongue. Statements of the tongue are important, but they need to be substantiated by action. <laughs> Moments ago, we promised 10 pounds each. To do what? To upgrade the sound system here. It's easy to put up your hand. Whether or not you're going to take it out of your pocket and put it in the box, that's between you and Allah. Subhanallah, this was just a statement to make sure it comes. <laughs> I'm thinking moments ago, as soon as I'm gone, I'm sure everybody would just say, Salaamu Alaikum out. Don't forget. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us honest people. Amen. It's easy to say something. It's difficult to put your money where your mouth is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us mouths that will not embarrass us. We say, oh Allah, we love you. Oh messenger, we love you. It's just like what we are getting in return. My sisters, I said a few days ago and I'm saying it again. When he says, I love you, it's just like how he says, I love the messenger. 
Why do we say that? Because when he says he loves the messenger, if he really did, he would not be saying that to you illicitly. Allahu Akbar. Did you hear what I just said? If he's married to you, it's fine. Yes, we're not talking about that. We're talking of illicitly. You want to say, I love you. I love you. Sister in Islam, I love you. And at the bottom we add FTOP. You know what that means? Or FTP. For the pleasure of Allah. FTPA. Yeah, I've seen it happening. I love you. And they've got a big sign with a smooch. You know, it's a little snog, mashallah. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> it's just a sign. They've got it going. And there's little emoticon that comes up. I love you with the emoticon. And at the bottom they say, FTPA, for the pleasure of Allah. <laughs> What's that? Is that like a password to commit sin? Wallahi, it's not. Be careful. It's a password to dirty your heart. And my sister, if you fall prey to that, you're equally guilty. Allahu Akbar, don't fall prey to it. When you love Allah and His Messenger, you wouldn't be saying that to someone illicitly. It's a sign. This is why I say, if such a person says, I love the Messenger, it's the same thing. Because they love the Messenger, they're not following Him. So they love you, and you're probably not the only one that they say, I love you too. And at the same time, they're probably using that statement just to get something out of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us. Do not abuse one another. Never abuse the opposite sex. Never ever respect the opposite sex. And remember, if you are used as a means to guide someone, it is better for you than anything of material value in this world. If that is correct, and it is correct because it's the hadith, then you need to remember the opposite is also true. If you are used to misguide someone, it is worse for you than anything in this world. Than the loss of the biggest materialistic items of this world. Worse than that. Imagine if you are used to misguide someone, you encourage someone to commit a sin, and they committed it. It's so bad, and it's such a dirty spot on the heart, that what will happen is, it would be equivalent or even worse than if you had to lose your house and your car and your job and your clothing and everything and driven out of completely everything and your bank account gone, everything done and you're sitting there bare. Why? Because you did something that is unacceptable. My brothers and sisters, it's about time we cleansed ourselves for the sake of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. Wallahi, we need to be worried for ourselves. When we die and we go into our graves, we will be on our own. It is the warm tears that will come to our assistance. When we've cried for the sake of Allah. رَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ Someone who remembers Allah on their own. They remember Allah in the darkness of the night or at any time of the day. And suddenly a warm tear rolls down their cheeks. That warm tear will bear witness for you, my brothers and sisters. May Allah grant it to us. Some of us, we've never cried except for that which was illicit. Girlfriend breaks up with you and you cry two buckets full. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and when you break up your link with Allah and develop a link with the devil, there's no tears coming up. When people remind you of your link with Allah and how He is the owner of everything. He's the owner of your heart. He's the owner of your eyes, your nose, your existence, your breathing, your life, your sustenance, your happiness. Then nobody cries. Or should I say, some don't cry. This is why the Prophet ﷺ used to say, أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ عَيْنٍ لَا تَدْمَعْ Oh Allah, I seek your protection from an eye that doesn't cry for your sake. May Allah open our doors. We cry over our sins. Ibki ala khati'atik is a hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ. He says, you need to cry over the sins you've committed. Weep, it's a sign of acceptance. It's a sign that you have turned. It's a purification of the heart. The tears are used to purify the heart for as long as they, are, they have been released for the right reasons. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us purity and goodness. Brothers and sisters, I have only tapped on very few angles of purification of the heart and purification of the soul. There is much to be said. But as you know, sessions of this nature will keep repeating themselves. It is your business. You need to make it your business to hunt for them, to make an effort to attend them, and inshallah to be a part of them. I want to end with one little point that comes to my mind, and that is, back at home we see the churches full. They sit for hours. 
three, four times a week, hours on end. And the other places of worship, but when it comes to the Muslimin, very few people. Can we fill this masjid for Salatul Fajr tomorrow morning as it is today? Or any masjid we are closest to in terms of the brothers. Can we do that? <laughs> By the will of Allah. We hope that that is the case. My brothers and sisters, work on your hearts. May Allah make me work on mine as well. No matter what level you've got to, there is always room for improvement. Always room for improvement. Never ever think that I have arrived. Never ever think I'm holy. Because a person who thinks he's holy, really has a few holes. <laughs> you need to know that. You need to be worried about your piety. Piety is a level that really even the pious are worried. Look at Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu going to Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. What a stalwart of the deen. What a man. What a great man. And he goes and he says, Ya Hudayfa, I just want to know something. The list of hypocrites that you have. Is Umar on that list? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. One of the highest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Two in the order. Number two in the ranking. And what happens? Allahu Akbar. He is saying, genuinely and seriously asking a question. Worried and trembling. Is my name on that list? Just let me know that. Did he ever think I'm a pious man? I am a Sahabi. And I was happy to be the companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I was given glad tidings of paradise, so I am pious. They were given glad tidings of Jannah, and they were still worried about that issue. Are we hypocrites? The Quran says, أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Addressing the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the address is even more for us. That your deeds might be wasted without you knowing because of certain bad conduct and behavior. So what about us? We ask Allah never ever to waste our deeds without us knowing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Inshallah we meet again for another dose. Inshallah at some stage whether here or elsewhere we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and grant us all paradise. Help us purify our hearts. Love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remove the clinginess that is in our hearts of the material world that is around us when it goes beyond a certain limit remember it becomes detrimental till we meet again we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk